come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart cometh evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. Did I read through that too fast? Let me read it slower. (laughs) Evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. This is what defiles you. And the reason it defiles you is because, and because it defiles you and I is because it's what's in really in our heart. And what is in our heart will come out our mouth. How many times have you said something you wish to God you hadn't said and said, That's, that really wasn't my heart? It was your heart at the moment. Or you wouldn't have said it. So own it. Quit making excuses. But I was just, I was just angry. I was just hurt. I was just bitter. Exactly. And what was in your heart came out of your mouth and it defiled you and it defiled all those that were around you. Be careful that no root of bitterness spring up in any of you so that it may not defile others. Want to fix your marriage? Want to fix your kids? Want to fix your relationship at work? Then quit pouring forth bitter and sweet water because it's not supposed to come out of the same vessel. And own what you say. Now the truth of the matter is, your heart may not always be as wicked, and I will use that word. It may be, not be as wicked all the time as what came out at that moment. But the very fact that that came out of your mouth or you did that at that moment proves that there's some kind of root inside of you and I that must be dealt with. Otherwise, there wouldn't be both bitter and sweet water coming out of the same vessel. Oh God, I feel the anointing here so powerful. Lord, set us so free this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus. You see, Jesus promised. Jesus promised that living water would flow out of us. John seven thirty seven through 38 Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, you have to be thirsty for this. You have to want this. You have to desire this. This is not something that's just going to happen for you. If you are satisfied with being satisfied with where you are in life, if you are happy with the way the state of your heart is, if you think you have already arrived, you will never be thirsty enough. To come to Jesus for more. But the promise still remains. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. You see, this kind of water the preacher can't give you. This this kind of water your mentor can't give you. This kind of... This kind of water your best friend can't give you. Your best Christian friend can't give you. You can sit in front of all your favorite preachers all day long and they're talking about the water. And we have come to a place where where, where voyeurism is the way of the church. We think if we've seen it and we've heard it, we've got it. And we've become satisfied with it. In Ezekiel 47, all the man could do, all the God could do was show Ezekiel the river. Ezekiel had to get in and out. And and there's an experience. 
There are exp- no, let me change that. There are experiences in God. And if all we have is a head knowledge, and you may have a great head knowledge, you may be able to quote half the Bible. I don't know. My hat's off to you. My ADHD, no way. I just, I have to, I forget what. That's why the fr- scriptures stay so fresh to me. It's every time I open it up and read it again, it's like, it's like the first time I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen that before. It's, it's, it's a real blessing because I never just read over anything that so I've read that a hundred times. No, it's like, oh my God, that's great. You're supposed to come and drink. And once you've drank because you were thirsty for the right thing, then it comes, He who believes in Me, as the Scripture said, from His innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus says, You come to Me, I'll give you a drink that is so good and so pure and so wonderful that you can't help to want to share it with everybody else that comes around you. And what comes out of your mouth is finally coming out of a pure heart. All right. Now, now last week, now I'm, I'm going to move quick through this because i got some, some stuff here for you. Last week we looked at the river that flowed from the temple that Ezekiel was was allowed to see in his in his vision in Ezekiel forty seven one through six and and we saw in those scriptures and I don't have time I'm not going to take time to read them this morning because I'm, I'm not going to preach for an hour and a half this morning but he showed him up the river and he had to walk almost a mile and a half to show him the whole river what I didn't show you last week was this was that river had five levels it was a trickle ankle deep knee deep, waist deep, and a torrent so powerful you couldn't swim in it. Five is the number of grace in the Scriptures. The farther along we go in our Christian life, the greater comprehension and understanding of grace we should have. And the more we walk with the Lord and grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, the more grace-filled we should become to others. Why? Because grace allows me to see God for who He is. I can't see Him until He graces me to see Him. And, and He allows me to see more and more of Him because of His grace that has been given to me through the blood of the cross of Calvary. Now, the more I see of Him, if I don't see the more of His holiness than I did before, there's something wrong. For He is holy. So the greater grace that I have, the more He allows me to see His holiness, the more His holiness I see by the grace He has allowed me to see Him with, the more humble I should become. I've actually had people come and confront me after church over this next statement I'm going to make in the past. I understand my need of a Savior more today than I did the day I got saved. You say, Pastor, are you that much bigger of a sinner now than you were then? God forbid, I hope not. But what it means is I've come to understand the incredible holiness of my Father. And it makes me look in the cross with that much greater wonder. Because even with His Spirit in me today and with me desiring to drink of living water and desiring to know Him, I still see too much flesh at times. I still see too much Wrong emotion, wrong attitude, wrong heart. And I look at His holiness and, and I try to blame my judgmentalism on His holiness when right now all He wants me to see is His grace and His mercy and extend it to others. The 
this water. Ezekiel 47, 48. And this, this is the scripture. We're getting up on the scripture where the, the, the um, vision statement came out of. But in, verse, in Ezekiel 47, verse 8, it says, And he said to me, These waters are going out to the eastern region. That's the water that's flowing out of the temple. And they go down to the Jordan Valley, and they come to the sea. Now remember, that's the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in the around, in, around the Dead Sea because the salt content is too high. Nothing can live around dead water. It's bitter water. You can't drink it. You can throw a live fish into the Dead Sea and within a few minutes, hour or two, it's dead. Why? Because the water's too bitter for it to live in. But these waters from the temple, they come down to the, down to the sea and flow into the sea where they issue out and the waters in the sea will be healed. For the sake of time, we're not going there, but the, the rest of it we will before the series is out. Through the rest of that, wherever this, wherever this sweet water comes in and deals with the bitter water, it's filled with life. I mean, supernatural life just appears. You go from having nothing to there being fish. You go from having nothing to there being trees with leaves that have healing on them. You go from what was once a dead sea that had no water going out of it to now a dead sea that is now alive and teeming with fish and that has broken its boundaries and is now flowing deeper into the desert in which it already lives. And when we, allow, when we deal with the bitter water by allowing the sweet water of the Spirit of God to flow through us, dead things can live again. And not only do dead things are dead things able to live again, but there are other living things that want to be drawn to us because they can draw life from us. And it's interesting that when there's life around you, it says in the Scriptures following, and again, I'm not going there for the sake of time, that there are actually fishermen, there are people that gather around the river. You don't have to go get them. How many here would like to have that kind of sweet water running in your own heart? Running in this church. I desire it. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty for that this morning. Now, spiritually, this speaks to us of allowing the Holy Spirit to cleanse the bitter water from our heart so that the sweet fruit to the Spirit may spring forth. Now, how do I know bitterness is the root that causes some of the issues I'm dealing with? Interesting mind, inquiring minds want to know. How do I recognize bitterness? Because you would think, well, I understand, but I'm not bitter. I'm going to step out on a limb here. Some people have already got this truth. And they've already allowed the Lord to come and wash out and and pull out roots of bitterness. But my pastoral guess would be that the overwhelming majority of people in here this morning and those listening to this message probably have some root of bitterness in them that is so painful and so hurtful that they've refused to deal with it. And because they refuse to deal with it, many things that are happening in their lives right now are happening because of things that happened years and years and years ago. Now, how do we diagnose bitterness in our hearts? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to do very quickly as we go through here. Let's diagnose a bitter heart. This week we're going to diagnose a bitter heart. Next week I'm going to give you examples of the ramifications of having a bitter heart. The, uh, what, what's the name of that dictionary I used? Mansur's Dictionary. And by the way, everything from here on out, full disclosure, is not mine. From here on out, I pulled it off of three different websites. All I did was Google how to recognize bitterness, how to get over bitterness, And oh my God, I started weeping. So none of this is mine. So go blame the web writer after this is over, all right? Because literally, none of this to the end is mine. But this dictionary says, Bitterness is a feeling of anger and resentment caused caused particularly by perceived unfairness.